So our first speaker is uh, Jeffrey Thompson. He's a professor of biostatistics at the Yale School of Public Health. He has made numerous contributions to infectious disease modeling and analysis with a focus on using diverse data set to inform public health via mathematical modeling targeted to address policy relevant question. His work on COVID-19 has influenced policy on quarantine and testing at the US CDC and ECDC too. So unfortunately, um, Jeffrey could not make it to be with us uh, today, but he's still with us uh, from distance. And I want to thank him warmly to uh, have uh, accepted of staying awake so late because he is in the state, or I don't know, maybe to have woken up so early uh, this morning, morning, one or the other. So I leave the floor to him. I just want to remind him that uh, we have a 30 uh, minutes time allocated to uh, his talk plus the question and answer. So uh, maybe 20 minutes talk and, and 10 minutes um, discussion with a, uh, with a participant and it will be difficult for us to uh, regulate that. So uh, I thank him in advance to pay special attention to, to, to the time. And uh, now, uh, Jeff, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for uh, that gracious introduction and uh, for offering me the opportunity to speak at this uh, um, uh, at this uh, very important uh, meeting. So uh, I'm going to talk today, uh, as uh, you all as listeners probably know, about optimal COVID-19 quarantine and testing. And I'll start just by giving the context of uh, some time ago now, December 2nd, and this is uh, 2020 I'm talking about, the US uh, CDC released some options to reduce quarantine for contacts of persons with SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, using symptom monitoring and diagnostic testing. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of text right here on this screen, but what I just want to emphasize to you is that um, at that time, uh, the quarantine, which typically was a 14 day quarantine, uh, was uh, diminished in terms of what one had to do to a, um, quarantine to about 10 days without testing, uh, and if no symptoms are reported during daily monitoring, and uh, an alternate uh, quarantine, which is that if there's diagnostic testing available, uh, then quarantine can end after day seven if a diagnostic test has come back negative and no symptoms are reported. So Jeffrey, this was sorry, a... Jeffrey, sorry for that. Yes. Um, I just wanted to let you know that you are sharing uh, the slide you're talking about and the next one next to it. And I, I don't know whether you're aware of that and whether you would like to instead just zoom out, zoom in on the on this on the full screen for the slide that you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, no. No. That would probably be better. We still see the, the slide on the side. No. Oh no. Still the slide on the side? Yeah, we, we have that like in um let me try it one more time. Yes. Yeah, perfect. perfect. Thank perfect. you. Thank yeah. you for uh, yeah. notifying me. I can't tell on my screen, unfortunately, which one it's showing. So uh, I'll just move forward now to here. Um, as I was saying, uh, uh, this uh, change was introduced uh, on December 2nd, and I wanted to talk about the basis of that change. So the basis of that change was uh, a number of studies that came out. All there At the top, you'll see um, just a little table of the CDC's own calculations. Uh, citation of a study by Quilty and Clifford, which was a preprint pending peer review, and a study by Wells et al., which was a study with Chad Wells and I um, and Alison Galvani, uh, which was looking at the post-quarantine transmission risk. Fortunately, all of these studies, which came out uh, uh, at similar times, uh, had uh, essentially the same result, which um, I think the coincidence of the three of them persuaded the CDC that uh, quarantines could be reduced in the case of a positive, uh, sorry, a negative test um, before day seven or so. So um, what kind of science, though, justifies this? Uh, that's what I want to talk a little bit about uh, in the rest of the talk today. Um, 
the basic question that uh, we asked uh, to justify this, uh, this shorter quarantine is what are the effects of different durations of quarantine and can RT-PCR testing help? Uh, in particular, what we did was a, sort of a three-part method. We used time transmission paired data uh, to quantify infectiousness across the COVID-19 disease time course. Uh, we used data on the sensitivity of RT-PCR across the post-symptomatic COVID-19 disease time course and uh, data on infectiousness, uh, viral shedding data across the entire disease time course to quantify the sensitivity of RT-PCR across the COVID-19 disease time course. And lastly, we determined how much infection is prevented by the quarantine and testing. And I'll go into detail on how we did that um, in three parts. So first of all, how, how do we use time transmission pair data to quantify infections? Well, this is a straightforward one because we essentially borrowed results from others. Uh, the earliest results on this are cited here by Hay et al. Um, and uh, Quinn et al., uh, which then sort of made a slight correction on that Hay et al. result. Um, and uh, that analysis gives you the result that um, an, and an incubation period of 8.29 days, which we sensitivity analyzed against a shorter um, incubation period as well, yields an infectivity curve across a disease time course that looks somewhat like this. And the important thing to realize is that there's a fairly abrupt increase in infectivity uh, after uh, toward the end of the incubation period, and then a slower decline later. And the uh, other important thing to understand is that if symptoms appear, it's possible that individuals will self-isolate, which again would uh, decrease the, um, the infection number of infections coming from an individual. Uh, and that may be decreased compared to an asymptomatic person who may not realize that they are sick and may not be able to take the same self-isolation measures. So what are the different duration, durations of quarantine? Um, how else can we, what else do we need to do in order to make this calculation? Using data on sensitivity of the RT-PCR test across the disease time course and data on infectiousness, we can quantify the sensitivity. This is a little more complicated to explain to you, uh, but basically there are studies that allow us to figure out RT-PCR um, uh, sensitivity across the disease time course. Uh, at least at the time that this first work was done, um, this has changed somewhat, although the results didn't actually change from, from this, but uh, at, when this was first done, there was only data uh, post-infection, that is once people became symptomatic as to whether what the diagnostic sensitivity of RT-PCR was, which left a, somewhat of a gap um, in the early uh, infectious period, uh, which we knew was abrupt and, and strong, but we didn't have a measure for how sensitive RT-PCR was for it. But fortunately, what we could do was use an interpolation function based on the viral shedding that we knew it was going on later on during symptomaticity uh, and map that uh, continuous function to uh, something else we know about, which is um, the... Uh, the viral shedding that we know from the symptom, symptomatic period. So in other words, uh, if we know what the RT-PCR level is and the, um, and the viral shedding are, then we can then interpolate backwards as to what the density of viral shedding was before. Um, and so just coming up with a function such like that, uh, that allows us to figure out the density of viral shedding in the early period prior to the, uh, the decline that happens uh, post-symptomatically. Uh, and that gives us a full uh, time course for the COVID-19 viral shedding. Uh, and that interpolation function then gives us the RT-PCR sensitivity uh, across this time period as well. In other words, um, we're able to use viral shed the viral load or viral shedding data um, uh, to inform what the RT-PCR sensitivity is likely to be because the RT-PCR uh, is just functionally entirely dependent upon the amount of viral load to tell you whether or not you're likely to get a positive result for someone who um, is infected. Uh, so filling in that information then allows us to uh, use uh, essentially a sort of just a double integral method to integrate over the probability that the test is sensitive and the amount of infectiousness uh, to give us a result, uh, which is the uh, probability of post-quarantine transmission uh, based on the duration of quarantine. So if a 14 day quarantine was viewed as uh, suitable, you can then compare that to other durations of quarantine that have testing or no testing, that have testing on entry, 
testing on exit or testing on both entry and exit. And at the time this was released, um, there were a number of different strategies. Some people were using a lot of testing on entry because they were interested in knowing whether someone was infected or not uh, as soon as they could. Others were using testing on exit to ensure that someone leaving quarantine was not leaving um, uh, infected. And uh, the result that you can see here, so maybe the biggest result is that you can see testing on exit uh, either with an exit entry test in addition or on its own is a far more efficacious way to reduce the probability of post-quarantine transmission than testing on entry is, the two uh, red or orange lines here. So first of all, first result, um, major result, uh, testing on exit to quarantine is a far more powerful approach. Uh, and when you implement it, it dramatically decreases the probability of post-quarantine transmission, which is the goal of quarantine. Uh, second result is that, uh, in fact, there, most of the benefit of quarantine occurs in the first seven days or so. And this was the observation that motivated a change in policy. Uh, extending uh, for a second week of quarantine is uh, troublesome and difficult for many individuals and also yields little additional benefit once you've uh, included a test on exit that is negative. So... Uh, Overall results compared to a 14 day quarantine with no testing, a seven day quarantine with testing on exit provides equivalent or lower probability of post quarantine transmission. Uh, and the other th comment that I just wanna mention is that each, dur uh, each duration of quarantine has a corresponding optimal day to perform testing. And this may seem a little counterintuitive in that it turns out, you know, if you have a one day quarantine, you're gonna do the test right away. This is assuming a 24 hour delay uh, in RT PCR. Uh, and then a two-day quarantine on the second day up until the seventh day, uh, you want to do it at the last possible date. After that, it doesn't matter as much whether you do it on the seventh day, eighth day, ninth day, tenth day, eleventh day, twelfth day, or thirteenth day, or fourteenth day. All of these days are essentially equivalent, although they are sort of changing slightly just um, uh, at the sort of in the nth decimal point here. Uh, and then in addition to doing that uh, mathematical modeling, we used uh, empirical data from offshore rig quarantine and testing, which is a sort of an ideal situation because you have a very controlled population, very controlled entry and exit. Um, no, no, known, no, no, we know there's no exposures coming from anywhere else uh, except for on the rig um, to allow us to validate the utility of say a five day quarantine with an exit test at 96 hours. Um, which is not exactly the seven day quarantine, but was uh, procedurally what could be done uh, with regard to the offshore rig situation uh, by the company that we collaborated with to do this, which was uh, the BHP Corporation. So looking at the positivity rate, um, what, uh, what, I, what you want, I want you to understand about these two figures is just that they're from two different rig systems. Um, and in the in the left-hand one, there were very few cases actually that came out positive um, uh, between April 11th and August 11th. Uh, August 12th, uh, three out of 820 individuals became out positive in testing. Uh, and uh, one was tested on entry and came out positive, and one came out positive at 96 hours. So this prevented both of those individuals from bringing uh, disease onto the offshore rig, uh, which is, a, if it were to happen, is a major calamity for um, the offshore rig situ situation because essentially, uh, if it started spreading on the rig, they would have to shut the entire rig down, which costs millions and millions of dollars every single day. Uh, so um, a second uh, data set was a bit more significant, and this was in a different location where there was a greater degree of transmission at the time. And what I want to emphasize here, again, there were 19 indicated that they were um, uh, actually infected on entry. Uh, um, and, but I want to emphasize that there were zero indicated that they were infected at 11 days. So there is a short, dura there's a duration past which you don't often find a positive if you have a good quarantine. Uh, but the most interesting data is on the far right here, which is uh, just that after, you know, 30 individuals out of 998 were, were caught on entry. Uh, but 15 were caught 96 hours uh, before exit. So every one of these cases is a case that did not make it onto the rig. And in fact, um, throughout this entire time period, not a single case uh, made it onto the rig. So a test at 96 hours uh, did a good job in both rigs, basically, of preventing uh, transmission from uh, reaching the rig population. Uh, and when the 
now, now, so that all is a calculation for what, uh, what you should do when you don't know anything about the day of infection. If you know the day of infection, which can be the case in contact tracing, a very similar calculation yields a specific optimal day, day to, to conduct the test, which is slightly different. And that is, it's not so surprising, but basically uh, you want to be conducting the day, test on, um, uh, on uh, let's see, the optimal day to conduct the, the test is about six days after you uh, were infected, no matter what uh, quarantine you're using. That's when you know you're infected. Um, and the, the reason why it sound, that may sound like it's a different result, but the important point is that when you know someone's infected, then you want to do it at a time when they're likely to um, come out positive. When you don't know whether they're infected or not, it turns out that the best thing to do is to wait an, as if it, they were infected at the last possible moment. So that's why there's a slight difference in uh, the optimal day in these two situations. Uh, so I just want to talk a little bit about the sensitivity of these results to the parameterization. Um, when this was done, uh, the overall transmission per infected case was specified as R0 equals 2.5. Uh, of course, uh, today we're dealing, dealing with the Delta variant, which has nearly twice as the R0 or perhaps even more. Uh, and for that reason, one has to be aware that the probability of, uh, of, trans of any transmission is even higher if you don't uh, do a, a quarantine. So there's some greater risk. Uh, and for that reason, one should be uh, even more uh, careful with quarantine and testing. On the other hand, another, uh, which isn't actually noted here, another thing that's sort of on the other direction is that individuals who are vaccinated, and this is still, there's still anecdotal data on this rather than a very strong study, but it seems that individuals who are vaccinated uh, carry the disease for shorter period. And from that standpoint, uh, a lesser quarantine may be merited for individuals who have been vaccinated previous to um, the occasion there where they've um, been at risk and uh, I need to travel. This latent uh, presymptomatic infectious period, as I said, was uh, specified as 2.9 days. There's pretty good data on that um, and that has val been validated in free other studies. So um, we're satisfied with that. Uh, this test was parameterized by the sensitivity of RT-PCR testing, not other testing such as antigen testing. I'll show you some results on antigen testing soon. Uh, and RT-PCR sensitivity was assessed based on data on symptomatic cases from this Miller et al. study. Okay, uh, another sensitivity analysis we did was we looked at whether higher levels of R0 or asymptomatic proportion uh, what they do, they moderately increase PQT, but don't affect the optimality. So again, that curve that I showed you, um, uh, you know, its inflection doesn't change with higher R0 or with a different asymptomatic pro proportion. Uh, so again, there's a real inflection point around seven or eight days, um, uh, which, uh, which can be uh, thought of as important in determining the quarantine that is most valuable um, under different r naughts and different asymptomatic proportions. Uh, also varying that latent period of 2.9 days has little effect on the infectivity curve or on the results. Uh, and also varying the latent period has little overall effect on the sensitivity curve uh, in terms of the diagnostic sensitivity of RT-PCR. Now, uh, as I mentioned, there's another kind of test that has since, since this time has become much more, pro more available, uh, much less expensive and much quicker to do, which is an antigen test. Uh, this is a review of a ton of tests from, uh, from 2020, which did not include the antigen test. And the point here is just to say that uh, the RT-PCR test, along with the viral isolation and uh, culture, were pretty much the only tests you could use to figure out whether someone was infected early on and were very vital to the detection of individuals who were infectious prior to their uh, or, or at the time uh, that they began to become uh, trans, uh, transmitting. The ability to do antigen tests uh, has enabled us to do more. Uh, here's the percent positive agreement between a rapid antigen test uh, uh, the BD Veritor test, which was one of the first to come out, and an RT-PCR assay. And it's not perfect. You know, the RT-PCR assay definitely has a higher sensitivity, um, and these are the days post-infection. Uh, but, you know, uh, for, for the, for the B first few days after infection, um, not for the first few days, but, but after, after the, around when symptoms appear and transmission starts, uh, the rapid antigen test is quite sensitive. And then later in disease, when transmission is unlikely, uh, because you just become a lot less transmissive later in disease, even if you become ill, um, then the main thing is uh, it diminishes somewhat. 
Now that was among the least effective of them. And so it can be compared to RT-PCR in the following way. This is the sensitivity curve that we calculated um, from uh, Wells et al. And here is the sensitivity curve calculated in the same way based on that, uh, that data I just showed you on the BD Veritor test. And you can see that the sensitivity is lesser than the RT-PCR. Now there's another thing to realize though uh, that um, that, that the other uh, antigen tests that have come out since then have uh, shown higher sensitivities closer and closer to RT-PCR. Uh, they all sort of lag a little bit in the days right immediately before the test. In other words, uh, RT-PCR is always going to be the best way to detect someone at a, mo at a given moment or figure out if they're sick at a given moment. The only, um, the only uh, thing that uh, makes that not quite as effective for that is that RT-PCR usually has about a 24 hour delay, whereas the rapid antigen test can be performed um, and uh, you can get results very, very quickly. And if that's the case that you have basically uh, instantaneous or near instantaneous R uh, rapid antigen tests compared to the RT-PCR, then looking at multiple tests here, and we've looked at more than this, in, in fact, it turns out that single rapid antigen tests on exit are nearly as effective as an RT-PCR with a 24-hour delay. Uh, and that's essentially because that 24-hour delay takes up the time when an individual goes from detectable only by RT-PCR to detectable by a uh, rapid antigen test. It's a very rapid rise in uh, viral load and in the amount of antigen exposed. Uh, and that's just with one test on exit. When you do a test on entry and exit, it actually becomes essentially um, as good or better in terms of a better, a lower probability of post-quarantine transmission to use two rapid antigen tests. And it's actually less expensive to do so as well. Um, and generally speaking, the fraction of antigen tests that outperform PCR, RT-PCR um, is quite high up to about seven days or so um, of quarantine. It turns out that RT-PCR is always, is, tends to be better um, late in quarantine in long, for long quarantines um, uh, in general. So just to summarize again, uh, compared to a 14 day quarantine with no testing, a seven day quarantine with testing on exit provides an equivalent or lower probability of post quarantine transmission. This is essentially still true today. Um, and, uh, what, uh, what, uh, is really important to emphasize is that testing on exit is far more efficacious than testing on entry. Uh, as a rule of thumb, the later the negative test, the more effective it is at preventing post quarantine transmission. This is also really important, and this hasn't been emphasized enough, I'm afraid, even since the pa our paper came out. But that rule of thumb is true uh, for events and for travel in general. Uh, sometimes you see regulations and policies that say someone needs to take a test within seven days before an event or four days before an event, and that's really not an efficacious way to do it. Uh, it hardly does anything to prevent the lower uh, to lower the probability of transmission. What you really need is a test done immediately before travel or the event, um, and ideally within one or maybe two days. Uh, and generally, shorter quarantines can be equally or more effective than a 14-day quarantine, uh, provided one testing one week into quarantine is conducted. So thanks very much for your attention, and if there's any time for it, I'd be happy to answer a question. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Very nice, very clear presentation. I have a first question related to your conclusion. You mentioned that your uh, your conclusion uh, is still true in the current context with a more transmissible uh, Delta variant. Uh, so you took that into a continued sensitivity analysis. What about those uh, emerging data about a shorter uh, incubation period or, or maybe even a longer shedding period with a, a longer infectiousness uh, period. Do you think it could um, affect your conclusion in terms of the uh, seven days conclusion? Yeah, um, it will affect it, of course. Uh, you know, so a shorter incubation period is going to tend to be, uh, you know, good news for the efficaciousness of a quarantine, um, and uh, but or and a longer, you know, uh, duration of transmission is going to be bad news for uh, a shorter quarantine, um, and mean that you need a longer quarantine. The one thing that I would emphasize, though, is the curve that I showed you multiple times. The way that sort of drops dramatically around seven days or so. Um, that drop is somewhat resistant to many different alterations of the parameterization. So while it might shift it a day forward or a day back, even quite large changes in 
the uh, duration of transmission or um, in the incubation period are unlikely to shift it uh, dramatically because again, that, that, that steep curve um, ends up manifesting no matter what the parameterization has, has turned out to be, uh, at least in all the analyses that we've um, managed to do on this uh, model. Thank you very much. Um, is there any question from the room? Yes, yeah. please. Uh, Simon Koshmes from uh, Institut Pasteur. Thanks a lot for the very nice presentation. So I have a, a follow-up question to Daniel's question, which is uh, what about vac uh, quarantine in vaccinated population? So like, how do you expect your recommendations to change? Yeah, um, as I mentioned, the vaccination seems, and, and this is really anecdotal data that I've seen, and it's possible the other data has come out I haven't monitored, uh, but what I've understood anecdotally is that uh, the duration of disease uh, for individuals who were vaccinated and then have a breakthrough infection tends to be shorter uh, and the amount of transmission tends to be less. Uh, so for those individuals, it would seem, and again, I think, you know, we really need solid data before making a policy decision on this, but, but it would seem that a shorter quarantine would be merited. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, it's one more reason to get vaccinated is that may mean you have uh, less of a quarantine to endure um, when, uh, when you do come down with disease. Thank you. Any other question? the room i'm just looking at the no q a panel victoria do you have any question yeah i had the same question as simon so i'll i'll formulate another one for a certain time in europe there was um, uh, there was this protocol of uh, different degrees uh, 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 of uh, um, interventions to be in place for people who had to fly from one country to another. And we know that some countries still have, uh, still demand a quarantine. So how, how your results will apply to a situation in which, such as this one, taking into account that flights, of course, then the, the, the probability of uh, importation depend also on the traffic, et cetera. Um, that's a wonderful question, and I wish I had a whole uh, another half an hour to talk about it because I have a whole talk here, which I could give on that <laughs> exact topic. Um, in my view, uh, the that is a very different situation. The from uh, contact tracing in quarantine, or some situation where someone was at high risk of getting COVID-19. When you have a very high probability that an individual has COVID-19, then, the, then I think the purpose of quarantine is to ensure that no transmission happens from an individual getting infected. On the other hand, most travelers are not infected with COVID-19. And so it is really a, a very egregiously strong public health measure to actually make uh, individuals who you have no indication are uh, ill to endure a 14-day quarantine or a seven-day quarantine and test even uh, when in fact they may not be infected. So research that we've been doing and that should come out in publication sometime soon, uh, it shows that if the goal is simply to prevent um, an increase in transmission within your country uh, and another country has say a similar level of prevalence, then um, as you might sort of reason from first principles, it doesn't make much difference if you've got travelers going both directions uh, to actually um, impose a quarantine. Yeah, you know, essentially, you don't get a lot of public health gain and all you're really doing is stopping people from trans traveling rather than actually decreasing the amount of transmission that goes on in your country. Now that's only true when the prevalence is equivalent and the mathematics works out in a way that's quite interesting um, and that we were able to uh, do in the work that I'm talking about. Um, uh, that, uh, that you can actually compare like individuals, you know, one country to another and what the total export of, of disease is essentially under these situations. And you get much, much shorter quarantines that are necessary if your goal is simply to prevent additional transmission in your own country, uh, quarantines of one to maybe three days or something like that. So, uh, uh, from a public health standpoint, you know, the, the benefit of these travel quarantines is very low unless you're, say, New Zealand or Australia in the early pandemic uh, trying to prevent any disease from entering your country whatsoever, in which case the, the same mathematics that looks just at the relative transmission in one country versus another says that you want a full 14-day quarantine. So this is not how public health policy has been made in the past. 
Uh, but I think it's a critical difference between what we really need to do and what we're doing as a as a global uh, um, as a, to to fight the global pandemic. Um, early quarantines that you need early on when a pandemic is just spreading are a totally different sort of scenario from what you need to do um, in a developed uh, pandemic where uh, individuals are infected in different countries. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jeffrey. We will definitely look forward for, for this uh, paper you mentioned coming out. Uh, 